Yes! Charlie the Unicorn has been completed. I know that uh, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to make be offering commentaries on it later, but I wanted to uh, get my voice out there early because there have been a few attempts to explain Charlie the Unicorn in the past, but that was only based on the first episode. Let me show you an example. Your information, Charlie the Unicorn is actually a very well thought out and well designed satire on religion. No. Yeah, that. And Nick said, no, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, it, it could be about religion, but it there's that's too narrow of a scope. Um, before I get into my analysis, though, I want to, to tell you that I put a uh, playlist in my description here where I put it together based on comments by Jason Steele of what's canon and what's not canon. Um, and let me explain that real quick. Charlie the Unicorn 1 and 2, and then the Hot Topic video, and then Charlie the Unicorn 3 and 4 are canon. Then the finale, all five episodes, is canon. The rest of the stuff I have in this playlist is not canon. Charlie the Unicorn, I'll explain that later in the analysis part of the video, is not canon. But it's in there. The playlist live and YouTube live videos are not canon. But I put them in there anyway because it's Charlie the Unicorn material. It's still funny. Um, the grand finale Kickstarters have expired. The It's Charlie the Unicorn time. That was still a Kickstarter video. Also expired. Uh, the two days left until the Kickstarter is over. Also expired. But I included those two videos because they have really big songs in them. And I know that songs are a big part of the Charlie the Unicorn series. And then, of course, Charlie the Yannicorn, completely non-canon. I did this almost entirely as a joke because, sorry, Starfish Catface mentions my favorite food twice. Actually, no, he mentions it once, and then Kenny Jesus mentions it once. Moon pie. Actually, they mention marshmallow pie, but a moon pie is a marshmallow pie. And, of course, my favorite flavor, banana. I have a whole box of them here. I get them in cases of six of these boxes at a time because I'm that big a fan. But you have to wonder, does Starfish Catface, does he like the chocolate mint ones? Does he like the regular chocolate ones? Does he like the vanilla ones, which are really bland? Uh, does he like the salted caramel? Uh, they also have pumpkin spice, but although they're in season right now, pumpkin spice is kind of like a dirty word in most cultures. It's yuck. Why would you do that? Why would you make pumpkin spice motor oil or toilet paper? Why the hell would you put that stuff in toilet paper? Okay, no. Uh, Starfish Catface would not be eating pumpkin spice toilet paper or motor oil. But he would probably be eating strawberry moon pies. Yes, they actually make strawberry. But only in the minis. He doesn't make them full size right now. Um, but that's beside the point. The Charlie the Unicorn Dating Simulator, uh, I think that's still online. It's just that it's not part of the story. Um, he does use story-related elements in it uh, as of the making of the game based on the Charlie the Unicorn 1 through 4 part. This is the part where I'm going to have to give you a spoiler alert and say, Spoilers ahead! The way to talk about this series is to mention details that you probably have not seen. So if you have not seen the finale, go watch it now. Use my playlist. Uh, you'll find a few surprises in the videos that you had either never seen or haven't seen since the Kickstarter. But and be prepared. It's like an hour and a half long. It's like a full-length feature film. So spend some time with it. But... At this point, if you haven't seen it yet, this is where you should stop the video, go watch it, and come back later. And now is where I start giving spoilers. Uh, I have compiled a whole bunch of notes from the Reddit thread that I that Jason still sponsored on Reddit. And uh, he came and answered a lot of questions, and actually a couple of questions that I asked, he answered. But I'm not going to go in through and read every single one of these. I'm just going to say that the thing that you have to remember is that Charlie's not alone in the world. It seems like he's alone, but that's because the world in which he lives is so depopulated 
kind of like the Thanos snapping his fingers thing, except it was like 90% of the world's population. He was happy to find someone, anyone, to be a companion. Uh, he, all the way through Charlie the Unicorn 1 through 4, he had a ongoing and undying hope that Pink and Blue would eventually be his friends because they were really the only people he, he knew who didn't explode after singing to him. This is an important element to the song. Everyone who sings to Charlie the Unicorn explodes after singing to him. And there's a very good reason for it. It's because everyone that Charlie the Unicorn meets outside of Starfish and Nix's ghost because he never actually meets Norwell. Nix's ghost and starfish, the only two things or creatures or animals or persons that he meets are not dead meat puppets. Yes, ev even the animals and creatures that sing to him, the Banana King, um, the Candy Mountain Letters, the Goatfish in the third episode, the Millipede, all corpse uh, corpse puppets, meat puppets. Um, the dolphin that sings to him in the finale is a meat puppet. Every song is sung by a meat puppet. So, what is the nature of this reality? At the end of the finale, you find out that there is a guy named Charlie the Unicorn inside of an office who happens to be named Charlie, who happens to be a unicorn. It's not any relation, it's just that his name and his species happens to be the same. Came up with the great idea of trying to corner chaos spirits in a cube, or chaos spirits in cubes, you know, each one to a separate cube, and harness them for profit. And being a magical creature, he decided to put magic siphons on these cubes, so that the chaos spirits could siphon magic in order to become more energy uh, powerful. And also, unfortunately, this cubes also gave them an enormous amount of power. So as whereas before they were little spirits that would do simple little prankster things like put a pebble in your shoe or cause milk to curdle overnight, now they suddenly had about the equivalent of a nuclear weapon at their disposal so they could, I don't know, outright kill people. Which, when Charlie... CEO Charlie unleashed them, they did exactly that. They just went out and wiped out the entire planet. And the story of the finale is about the heroics of the animals and creatures and Charlie the Unicorn bravely trying to lock them away. Um, an important parallel is that Mayor Slove thinks the same thing that CEO Charlie did and Nix very quickly and unequivocally tells him, no, no, that is not possible, that is not viable, that is not beneficial, even to you, who was already dead. Now, one thing that a lot of people asked was whether or not the Chaos Spirits puppeteering dead animals was that the Chaos Spirit speaking, or was that the character of the body, uh, dead body that they were puppeteering speaking? Jason said that the corpse meat puppets were more reflecting the personality of the character they used to be. So, when Mayor Slove asked about profiteering off the Chaos Spirits, that was actually Mayor Slove talking. Um... When the Banana King talks about how happy Charlie would be if he stuck a banana in his ear, that's actually the Banana King talking. Um, but to get past the question of whether or not Charlie the Unicorn is about religion, like this guy says, or is it a broader scope than that, it is a broader scope than that. And I personally believe that the meaning of Charlie the Unicorn is reflected in this lyric from Deep Purple, song called Don't Let Go. Be what you are, I tell myself, hey, myself tells me we can be anybody. Yes, it's be who you are. Plain and simple, that, and I'm going to read a few passages here to explain this. 
Oh, I also wanted to, before that, I wanted to say, report what Jason said about how he wrote the script for Charlie the Unicorn. He said, The first draft of the script was written in 2016, based on an outline I wrote in 2008. The outline was just that, an outline. It gave important plot elements like the true nature of pink and blue, and a brief mention of what happened in the past, but didn't include any information about the characters involved in those past events. So I knew a council of weasels had failed in their guarding of the chaos spirits, but I didn't have a character named Norwell. I knew that there was a magical city that fell, but I didn't have a name for that city or its leader. I did know that at the begin beginning of it all would be a CEO who was also a unicorn named Charlie. A lot of my shorts have included business characters over the years. Yeah. Have you ever taken a holiday? Yeah. 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 is a wonderful guy. Yeah. 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 But the themes that naturally arise out of such a revelation definitely matured over the years. In other words, he came up with the core of the story, and then he wrote each episode. He came up with the core of the story right after doing Charlie the Unicorn 1. And he wrote each episode with an eye towards what was going on in the world contemporaneously around the time when he did it. But he had an overarching story that would lead to what ends up happening in the fifth episode. Now, fair warning, unless you haven't seen it yet, or, you know, if you have seen it, you know this already. But fair warning, the finale is a cosmic horror story. Although it's still Charlie the Unicorn with Charlie the Unicorn's humor, it does fit squarely in the genre of cosmic horror. So... Don't be surprised when the story turns out to be quite a bit different than what you expected. The treatment of it is very Charlie the Unicorn. So it's not going to be so different that you're going to go, Oh, what the hell happened? No, it's still Charlie the Unicorn. But there was a question about the ending, Charlie using negative emotions like anger and sadness in spite of basically the entire series being tried, being told to fake happiness. Um, I want to show a graphic here of someone who did an analysis of the story in terms of clinical depression. The Candy Mountain song is about consuming your life with material goods, i.e. materialism, and what culture wants. The Banana King song is about self-medicating. The Goatfish song is about surrounding yourself with friends, and this is a very important point to make in family, to make yourself feel better about yourself, reminding yourself about how people love you, and therefore you must have some worth. Unfortunately, this usually works backwards and makes people feel worse about themselves, worried about the fear of disappointing and or losing their loved ones. This was a very subtle thing. And then, of course, the Millipede is about... Th idea that fame and fortune will make you happy, and by proxy, anyone who is famous and or fortunate has no reason at all to be sad or depressed. Again, that dismisses the real underlying mental issues that, yes, even famous and fortunate people are still depressed too. They can just afford therapy. They can afford medication. They can afford to do engage in pastimes that keep them preoccupied. Um, and of course, the dolphin song is victim blaming, just plain and simple victim blaming. And all of the characters explode because ultimately these methods are unhealthy and self destructive. Now, Jason said, I've found that most of the time people peddling a positive thoughts only outlook have something to gain by doing so, and they don't have your best interests at heart. There are definitely negative thought patterns one can get into. I've had lifelong depression, and there are a number of treatments that have helped me manage it over the years. The stuff that hasn't helped are people telling me my depression is a failure of character, and that I could be happy if I just put in the effort. Also, sometimes people get depressed or angry because things are depressing and bad. Sadness and anger are natural and often healthy emotions, depending on the situation. So this is what Jason was really trying to say. And this is why I believe that the whole theme, because it's both about depression and about capitalism, but the whole 
theme of Johnny the Unicorn is be who you are. Don't let somebody tell you that who you are is wrong or unhealthy. I mean, there may be consequences to who you are that are unhealthy, but you need to learn how to live with who you are without engaging in self-medicating that can harm you or engaging in materialism that will leave you broken just as unhappy as before or latching on to people with emotional blackmail, basically, to make yourself feel better only to result in you feeling worse or to think that things like fame and fortune will make you happy. No, they won't. Money can't buy happiness. Fame can't buy happiness. Fame actually makes people miserable. There's a famous meme that I put up on Twitter several weeks ago about a ladder leading to nowhere. And I made the joke that this was posted by a corporate entity as some inspirational meme. And I thought, what, the idea that a ladder leading upward leads to nowhere? And of course, the victim blaming thing says that if, if, if you're unhappy, it's because you're unhappy. Well, yeah, but what are we going to do about it? We need to solve the problem. Well, not necessarily solve it. Just learn how to deal with it. Do what you do. Be who you are. That is the theme. Um, a user called Ryanias um, commented, This is something that I had noticed and was thinking about making a post about, but you explained it a lot more clearly and concise than I could have. But yeah, I think this is definitely the case. All the way back with the bad in the world is hard to hear when in your ear a banana cheers. It was clear to me that a point was being made. These characters are not imparting good or realistic lessons to Charlie or the audience. None of this is meant to be taken as good advice. The world is constantly telling Charlie that he needs to change because of what a miserable grumpy piece of shit he is, when in reality he doesn't actually seem like a bad guy at all. His frequent anger and frustration is actually completely warranted with how he's treated by his peers. Charlie'd never wish or mean to cause harm to anyone. The poor guy just wants to some quiet time to himself. There's a similar and much more blatant message in The Loneliest Platypus, which I think is one of Jason's more underappreciated videos. It's definitely not subtle, but it communicates its point about societal expectations and hypocrisy in a rather amusing way. Pesky Magico comments, Hello, I don't know if it's too late for questions, but I guess I'll find out. One of the things that stuck out to me about the finale was its recurring theme that hasn't really shown itself across the past Charlie the Unicorn episodes, the theme of short-sighted greed. Mayor Slov appears to be the archetype of a greedy capitalist. Susan X, Empress of Sea City, City of the Sea, ensured her submission to the Cubes after a mere 10 years in exchange for a large sum of money. CEO Charlie caused the cube catastrophe in the first place in the name of the possibility for profit. On the opposite side of the scales, Charlie the Unicorn, powerless and is doomed to live in this dead world that the foolishness and greed of the powerful has created, all the while having to deal with the same powerful people, or rather the puppets piloted by the catastrophe they caused, telling him that the problem is in his head, and that he should learn to be complacent in the world they made for him and that his failure to do so might be a failure on his part. Charlie is upset that the withered and dead world he has to inhabit, but the singing dolphin at the beginning of the finale tells him he should perhaps be more concerned with cleaning his room before he tries to criticize and change the world. So, yeah, that's some pretty powerful stuff. And I wanted to credit those particular users with their words, because they were the only people outside of Jason that I've quoted. Um, so yeah, remember that. Every th creature that Charlie meets outside of Starfish and the Ghost of Nyx are meat puppets, speaking what the Chaos Spirits want Charlie to hear. Um, another important thing that I wanted to point out is the Marshmallow People series that a lot of people have forgotten about were originally written to be Charlie the Unicorn episodes. But Jason makes an important point that pink and blue, the unicorns, are always doing stuff to people or the world around them. The marshmallow people are constantly reacting to things outside of their control. And that was a very important distinction that he made. And that's why he made the marshmallow people a different series, a separate series. Um, I am not going to... 
talk endlessly about the four characters in the video segment that I put up there. Oh, there's this. Um, I wanted to show off, this here is a timeline by a user named Joe Pod. He breaks down how the proper chronology of the storyline is supposed to happen. And I think I'll put this, well, I'll have it right here in the video, but I'm not sure if you can read that very well. But again, I've got the link uh, to the Reddit page where these comments are in the description below. And um, in order to continue giving credit to where credit's due, this is Deep Purple's new album, Turning to Crime. It's basically a cover songs collection. But uh, I, I quoted Ian Gillen earlier, so I have to give them credit. And of course, I also need to show off my book, Appearing to Study Particle Physics. Um, I don't remember if I make any references to Charlie the Unicorn in it, but I did do a video recently where I showed off the Weasels, the Weasel Council, you know, talking about a Franz Kafka app that I have on my phone. And I think that's all I need to say, except go out and buy banana moon pies.